And that's kind of what my job is, is to set the OSHA standards that make sure that we're compliant with all of this and make sure that our programs for teaching our technicians uh, the specific things that they need to do their job safely. Setting up a Bitcoin site may seem abstract, and that's why today I am joined by Compass's Operations Training and Safety Manager, Dylan Perry. Dylan, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Jared? I am doing great. And just like the intro, and I know we've already talked a little bit off mic, let's dive into setting up sites because I think that sometimes these things can seem abstract. You know, it's just like, what is this? How does this work? And, and I had Jeff Bryan on, and I think you were able to listen to that episode where we were talking about his role as a site manager. But even before he gets to come in to be the site manager, it would be great to learn about setting up Bitcoin mines and its evolution. Because I know you've been around Bitcoin mining for quite some time. So how has it evolved? And I'm asking you a lot now, but also <laughs> feel free to share how you also got into Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. Yeah, I got into Bitcoin mining um, about 2016. I actually started mining Ethereum on graphics cards and then transferring that over to Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I, I built a gaming computer in high school and realized I could make money off of the components. So <laughs> it's an easy decision. Um, and since then, you know, GPU mining, it's not really profitable. Tapered off pretty quickly uh, once ASICs became available. So... I wasn't able to mine for too long, but I definitely got an appreciation for the whole ecosystem because of it. And so that was back in 2016, and I was actually mining with GPUs in a basement, some Ethereum in 2021, obviously pre-proof of stake. Mm -hmm. Just due to the energy and what was going on, we couldn't really get into, uh, into Bitcoin. Uh, the ASIC prices at that point were wild, as many people know. So we were looking at it, we're like, okay, well, you know, mine some Ethereum. So, okay, how has it changed Aside from just the hardware, and now, you know, let's get right into the setup. How has site development and setting up a site changed? I, I don't know how far back you want to go, but, you know, if you could talk about some evolution. We talked a little bit about the evolution of the hardware from the GPU into the ASIC. Share, please, because I, you know, I, I'm not really sure where, what we were doing, you know, in 2019 yeah, and 2020. It definitely came from a hobbyist's perspective, right? So initially it was just people running nodes and ASIC miners in their own house. And eventually it transitioned to more industrial settings. And now we have sites, you know, upwards of hundreds of megawatts of utilization. You're talking in the tens of thousands of ASIC miners on site. So you, you have a massive expansion in just the sheer size of these mining operations. You know, they went from, you know, maybe a dozen or two dozen computers to, like I said, tens of thousands. And that comes with a lot of constraints. You have noise, heat airflow, and then also networking, which is a really big oversight in a lot of mines that I've seen. It seems to be kind of an afterthought, right? And if you're setting up a site and you want to scale, you have to set it up for the scale you want to reach. You can't upgrade as you go in some senses. So it's really important to have a big picture of what your plan is before you start to build a Bitcoin mine. Speak more on that, because I think that that's a really interesting thing is what you basically said is you can't grandfather in stuff. So it's like, yeah. you know, you're going to get your computer. Everyone watching this has some tech in front of them. And it's like, especially with a laptop, right? This has always been something that's been a knock against apples from my friends who are more PCs and I'm an Apple person. They're like, hey, I can't add in stuff. I can't add in extra storage, right? I can't add in things because it just kind of comes stock. And is that kind of what you're saying where the Bitcoin mine is kind of not as dynamic, it's kind of static. So you need to think about, you need to think about a year or two years down the line, even when you're building today. Exactly. Yes. Because you have to think about the way that the mine is going to expand, right? So say you start off with a mine that has just two shipping containers, but eventually you want to add 50 or more. You have to plan for that total size initially. You can't just say, oh, we have extra space here. We can throw them. It might work, but you're going to run into a lot of issues that might become really big issues later. Um, I've seen sites before where you drop containers and then someone realizes, oh, we can't fit another container in here because there's not enough room between the two exhaust sides. You'll either have heat reintroduction in one container or one container is just going to completely blow the exhaust of another container away. And... You know, you're going to be left with all that exhaust inside of the container still. Okay. 
these are not things that I'd ever considered, to be honest. I'm not someone that's working in the mine every day, nor do I have an experience like you do in setting up mines. How often now in your work with Compass, and maybe not with a Compass-specific mine, but just in the industry, do you hear of people that are basically not planning ahead for the future adequately? And I, and I also want to shout out that I think it's probably really difficult to plan ahead knowing that many Bitcoin miners – you know, having a hodl is a privilege, and we talked about that here on the show with Anthony Power, and we were talking about some of the some of the bigger miners, right? Some of the publicly traded miners. But I'm just trying to think about maybe a smaller miner. They may be needing to sell their Bitcoin back to the market every single month to be able to to cover their operations, and so it may be really, or it seems like it's really difficult to think two years down the line in an industry where the hardware is moving as fast as it is. We're seeing so many new pieces of hardware come online. Every time I, I feel like I look on the internet, somebody else is starting to make new mining equipment. You have a, a volatile price in Bitcoin that may or may not make it easy for someone unless they have a lot of cash reserve or a hodl. So how many of the problems or some of the challenges in Bitcoin mining after you set the site up come from maybe not seeing far enough down the track with the site set up? I've seen a lot of that, actually, and I think it comes down to people, you know, wanting to mine Bitcoin profitably and cutting corners where they think they can cut corners. But sometimes you just can't. I've seen, you know, poor rack structures where we've had to rebuild sections of Bitcoin mines because someone thought that they could get someone to do it cheaper. And while they did get it cheaper, now they have to rebuild a whole section. And that comes at a price, right? I mean, now you're looking at downtime for the machines. You're looking at extra labor to redo something that should have been solid from the beginning. Yeah, cutting corners is never a good thing in any industry. The, the old saying, you really do get what, what, what you pay for as far as a setup like that. So your title, and once again, may or may not have to look down here at my notes, is operations training and yeah. safety manager. So how much of your time is actually set spent or you know invested setting up sites as opposed to some of the other things that are kind of in your wheelhouse it's about i would say 50 50. Um, a big part of my job is just going to sites making sure that they're as efficient as possible and if there's anything we can do to make them more efficient then i come up with an action plan and make that happen um, you know we're always going into new sites taking over older sites that need modifications so that's a big part of my job is just making sure that everything runs as efficiently as possible and making sure that there are paths to get us more efficiency. So beyond setting up sites, talk to me about the training component and how that kind of parallels with the setting up of the sites. So when we're setting up sites, um, we typically hire our technicians during that initial setup period. So these technicians, you know, they're coming in and they're Bitcoin guys usually. Uh, and that's what we hire them for, for the love of Bitcoin. And usually they have some experience mining, right? Usually it's hobby mining, not anything to scale like we're about to do. So they have, you know, some experience. They might have some networking experience or technical like computer troubleshooting experience, which is typically what we're looking for. But, you know, that, well, it correlates. It doesn't directly let you jump into managing like a 20 megawatt site, right? There's still a lot of steps in between. And this is a brand new industry. There's no training available aside from just jumping in and learning, right? So these people will come in and they'll know basic computer things, but they won't know how to navigate a network, right? I know we talked a little bit offline about the scale of these sites. You know, you're talking tens of thousands of machines and these, these computers don't have any, uh, they don't have any display. There's no HDMI hookup. You're not hooking them up to a computer screen. You're using IP navigation to physically find and uh, troubleshoot these machines. So each device that's connected to the network has an IP address, even your cell phone. They get an IP address when it's connected to the network. And that's how you access the machines is through their IP address. And now tracking 10,000 IP addresses that, you know, depending on the network cert, um, situation, they might change overnight. So you can't say just this IP address is this machine. You need a robust system to track the machines. You know, we use MAC addresses, which is the uh, individual address that is given to the access controller. Um, and this address never changes unless we change the control board. 
So there's a lot of intricacies that go into running a site at scale that really no one has experience doing except for the people that have been doing. So there's a lot of space that, you know, you can only cover with hands-on training. And that's why it's so good and so important that we hire people ahead of when we're going to go into these sites. So we can kind of train them up but when it's ready to run. I can just let them run it, take my step back and go into another site. So, okay. When you're talking about, and now we're, we're talking about kind of hiring or, or on some level of, you know, expanding the team and thinking about the knowledge that we want to bring in. You said that it's great if they're a Bitcoiner, obviously you don't need to be a Bitcoiner to work in Bitcoin mining. We know that, but it's like, okay, if they're a Bitcoiner and they're bringing that passion and they have some history in IT, where is then, you know, what is the gap? What are the things that are maybe some of the biggest challenges for you when it comes to training new people up? Um, you know, things that maybe just don't make sense, right? Yeah, I would say one of the biggest things is monitoring, right? There's not a lot of tools that are really robust for this type of network. Um, you know, Bitcoin miners and ASIC miners in general, they're a very specific type of server um, where they only do one thing. That's what ASIC is, Application Specific Integrated Circuit. So they only mine, that's it. Um, and really like monitoring that hash rate and making sure that the machines are online all the time, there's not a lot of great tools available right now. Um, you know, and the ones that are, are not always complete, right? You need to fill in the gaps with other things. Uh, so spreadsheet tracking is something that's super important making sure that all the serial numbers match the MAC addresses, that way we can properly find the machines in the racks. Because like I said, you know, the IP address, that's how you access the machine, but it can change. Um, the MAC address only changes if we change a control board. And there's just a lot of intricacies like that, that if you make one small mistake, it's gonna make tracking all the machines or finding their location really difficult. Um, and that, I think that's, it's really important that we nail that down so that we, people can properly monitor the site. So training, we've talked a little bit about training now. I'm sure that that now plays into your roles and responsibilities as someone who's OSHA certified. I'm not sure what the actual nomenclature is, you know, an OSHA representative. What are some of the things in and around a Bitcoin mine that can present safety issues? Obviously, we have a lot of electricity. Obviously, we have electronics. What else? You know, I have friends that are in construction. When I think about OSHA for them, it's like, yeah, they're up on a high rise 20 stories up. And it's like, yeah, they have to have a cable or a harness on when they're doing certain things. And if they don't, that's a massive violation, not only putting their safety, but potentially the safety of other workers on the site. So in a Bitcoin site, what are some of the things that you try to look out for, uh, you know, from an OSHA standpoint? Yeah, like you talked about high electricity. Some of these sites run at 415 volt, which is pretty high voltage electricity. Um, you know, and our technicians go all the way back to the main breakers to shut off containers. There's a lot of aspects of the electricity that pose a risk. Um, you know, these machines are manufactured in China, and occasionally the power supply is just poof. So there's, there's a lot of electricity hazards that we have to train our technicians on, make sure that, you know, they can read a multimeter, that they know all of the different calculations to calculate wattage for amperage and make sure that we're not overloading PDUs because that's a, a possibility as well. Um, one of the other things that's really important is sound. These mines are typically north of 100 decibels. Um, and that's, that's a lot of noise when you're sitting in a Bitcoin mine for eight hours at a time you know, sometimes 12, depending on the workload. So we, we have pretty extensive PPE requirements to make sure that our technicians are operating safely because there's a lot of things like, uh, you know, you have a lot of air flowing through these containers and they can pick up debris and that's a hazard to your eyes or to your lungs, to breathing. So we try to make sure that our technicians are as safe as possible in these sites. And that's kind of what my job is, is to set the OSHA standards that make sure that we're compliant with all of this and make sure that our programs for teaching our technicians uh, the specific things that they need to do their job safely. Can you, and, and I don't know if you can do this, but I'm very interested now because I'm trying to find a way to explain what 100 decibels is. Because I know in the future, one of my friends who's not in Bitcoin or Bitcoin mining is going to say, hey, tell me about work. You know, what, like, what, why is Bitcoin mining so challenging? And I think the things that I often hear are heat 
and noise. <laughs> so the heat, I can kind of understand like that. If you say, yeah, I'm, you know, cause I've been in a mine and it was like 140 degrees and people are like, wow, that's insane or whatever. Yeah. That is something that's pretty transferable, right? We've all been in a hundred plus heat. And so when you go from there, but for a hundred decibels, do you have any way to easily explain that to me so I can share it with other people who are asking how loud these things are? Imagine you're standing next to a jet engine for eight hours straight. That's pretty much what it's like. It's a uh, wow. pretty intense. Yeah. And you know, the more machines you have in a smaller structure, the more noise you have. So it can be anywhere from, I think the lowest that I've seen per container was about 75 decibels. And that's, you know, if you're standing there for eight hours without hearing protection, you're going to, you're going to be hearing ringing in, in your ears for days. So we have, we always have a big old bucket of, you know, the good old gumdrop earplugs for all the people that come on the site, and, you know, aren't anticipating that because it's, it's something that, you know, a lot of hobbyists think about, but when you're running 10 ASICs in a room, sure, it's a little loud, but when you're running 10,000 ASICs in a room, it's really loud. Yeah, that was definitely one of the things I noticed. It was kind of like, and that was an amazing answer. If you're staying next to a jet engine for eight hours, because most yeah. people maybe listening to this have, you know, traveled and you've been at the airport or you've been on the plane and you've looked outside and you've seen someone in, who's was working around there and they've got, you know, massive protection on. And I, I remember being in the mine and it was kind of like being at a rock concert or in a loud bar or just a loud environment mm -hmm. because I had my own, I had earring protection, but even then when I would try to talk to somebody next to me, I was yelling, you know, I was like screaming, right? And the second you almost go outside and you're still doing that, you're yelling at somebody, right? So it is a very loud environment. And we've talked about energy from a safety standpoint and you and I were talking off mic about this, but I really want to get into this as well because I think... There's a couple of things. First of all, it's like, okay, how loud is it? How hot are Bitcoin mines, right? And then it's, okay, what about all that energy? Is that being done in a way that is, and we're going to use the S word, right? Sustainable. I think sustainability is a word when it comes to energy, especially is a word that's overused and probably widely misunderstood. And it's almost used too much to a point where people are like, oh, what, what does that mean anymore? But within the context of Bitcoin mining, we were talking about some of the great benefits of having Bitcoin mining for communities. And this actually is something that continues to come up on, on this podcast and just throughout the industry. If you listen to other content that people are making, this is something that's constantly being talked about because as you know, it's something that is controversial, right? Is Bitcoin using too much energy? Is, is it, is it not giving back uh, for what it's taking, you know, maybe from our overall energy global profile. And I think you and I know differently. So I'd love for you to touch upon some of the ways you're seeing energy, you know, or Bitcoin mining being a plus for local energy, regional, and then maybe national energy grids. Yeah, I think it's really important because Bitcoin, particularly Bitcoin being a controllable load is really important for the energy grid, right? Um, and we'll, we can talk about that a little bit more in depth a little bit later, but let me answer the rest of your question first. Um, I think that it's really important for Bitcoin to continue scaling the way it has, because when we build new Bitcoin mines, we have to upgrade existing energy infrastructure, right? You're not going to pull 200 megawatts for a new Bitcoin mine out of thin air, right? We're going to have to build substations and transmission lines to carry that power. And ultimately, what that means is that we're expanding the energy grid for everyone, not just for us, right? And that's going to allow more people to get power that you know, might not have been able to get power in the future because there were no transmission lines, there wasn't a substation there, things like that. And it's really important for as our population continues to grow, that we're able to scale up our energy production. Renewables play a huge factor in that. But the thing about renewables that many people don't understand is that if they overproduce, you'll end up blowing generation equipment down the line, because you're producing energy that's not being consumed. So in this case, we have to turn off windmills or manually disconnect solar panels so that way we're not overloading the grid with energy. Um, and if we have Bitcoin mines, we're able to consume that energy and reduce downtime on certain renewable energy farms. See, these are things that I don't think are often taken into account. That idea of renewable energies potentially being not beneficial. I don't want to say negative, but not beneficial if they're, you know, pumping energy that no one's using at that point, it's like, okay, then what? So now if you could, well, let's go back. I'd love to hear more about that controllable load, because I think that that's a huge benefit of Bitcoin mining 
that maybe someone who's not familiar with the industry just isn't aware of. And I said this on the last episode I was on with uh, Brad James from Mining with Brad. Full transparency, before Bitcoin mining, I just wasn't in tune to the idea of electricity, power grids, and the like. It, it just wasn't on my radar. I think for many of us in the world, if we have the privilege to just go over to your light switch and turn it on and have light, that's something that not everyone in the world has. And because it's so ubiquitous, at least in, in, you know, in the United States at this point, it's something we maybe take for granted. So if you could talk about the controllable load and then how that maybe, you know, impacts local communities, as you were saying, you know, that would be, that'd, that'd be great. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that we think about is as we're going into the hotter months, especially air conditioning units take a lot of electricity. And I'm sure, you know, most people understand that. But when you're talking about turning on, you know, hundreds of thousands of air conditioning units at once, that creates a massive spike in the usage in the energy grid. And if there's nothing to turn off, you're going to reduce yourself to a blackout, right? But now, if you got, say, a couple hundred megawatt Bitcoin mine down the road and everyone turns on their AC, the power company is going to reach out to them and say, hey, we need to shut you down for 10, 20 minutes so that way we can redo how the the power is being sent out to everybody and you know that prevents a blackout we only have to shut down for a certain amount of time for them to recalibrate the energy grid and if that wasn't there we'd be in a blackout and no one would be able to cool their house so the fact that we can be a controllable load for energy grids in case of overloading is really big just for everybody right to be able to cool their houses heat their homes in the winter or you know just kick back and play your xbox when you get home from work there's times when you know we'll curtail for less than 10 minutes just so that way the sites can reconfigure how everything is being sent out you know i wasn't aware that it could be even as short as 10 minutes for some reason in my mind's eye and maybe in and around the time when i was in texas where there was curtailment it seemed like it was longer but maybe that's a perception that's not indicative of the reality it depends on the, the energy market. So there's different okay. plans for every every mine, right? It might be a lot longer depending on where you are, what the needs of the, the general area are as well. Um, but in certain areas, like more rural areas, typically you sign on for a set amount of curtailment per year. So you agree to, say, you know, a couple hundred hours of curtailment per year. Um, and obviously that depends on everyone's individual agreement with their power company. It always varies. Nothing's really set in stone or standard. Yeah. We actually just put out and I'll link it in this episode's description, a curtailment educational video. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I thought was cool about the video was we call it the fact that, Hey, you know, as Bitcoin miners, we curtail to support local energy grids. Cause it's kind of like, if we're not going to support the local energy grids, you know, it needs to be a symbiotic relationship and you talking about, Hey, look, when a Bitcoin mine comes to town, you're going to get to update your infrastructure that as we know is probably just not going to be paid for by local taxpayer money or by local government funds. So it's kind of like an external amount of money. You know, it's a, it's a foreign injection of capital to a local energy grid. And then we're saying, and then in the summer months, if we're going to turn on, like you said, tens of thousands, if not even a million AC units in some of the larger, you know, metropolitan areas where it's going to be very hot and you're going to need AC, you now have this controllable, flexible load that we're going to be able to wind down in a moment's notice to be able to rebalance. And then we could turn it back on. What are some other benefits from an energy standpoint um, that you want to talk about or, you know, maybe aren't spoken about enough? Well, I think the the big thing about curtailment plans, particularly when we're talking about Bitcoin mining, is in some areas, you know, signing onto a curtailment plan is the only way that you're going to get a a profitable energy price, right? And that's really important, especially coming out of post-having, where, you know, the cheaper the price, the more profitable the machines are, and it matters now more than ever. So making sure that, you know, we're on a curtailment plan that brings our energy down to a profitable level is really important. Before we hopped on this episode, you were actually sharing that you've just moved to Colorado. And in my like, you know, when I think about it, I I don't think Colorado is a place that gets so hot in the summer that maybe you need to curtail. So maybe you could talk about the different types of environments that will, 
you know, need curtailment. Yeah, curtailment's really, it's, it's important too in cases where, you know, we might have a blackout in a certain area due to a generation failure and they're able to reroute electricity, taking it away from the Bitcoin mine and, you know, directing it to the area that needs it through other transmission lines. That's one instance where it's really important. Um, another would be like you were talking about, you know, sometimes uh, heat is electric. It does. It, there are instances where heat is needed, um, needs electricity to run properly. So, you know, in instances where it's really cold, I'm talking like negative 40 in Canada, we see some curtailment sometimes up there, especially when, you know, they have certain transmission lines that are down because of excess snowfall or ice. You know, if someone hit a, a power pole or something like that. You know, they can reroute that electricity and make sure that people can heat their homes, too, because it does work both ways. Right. Um, you know, more so we see a lot more so in the, in the summer with people needing to cool their homes and just I mean, you, you need to cool office buildings too, right? public areas. And that's a huge load on the system to be able to cool, say, a mall, right? A 10,000 square foot mall. That's that's a lot of conditioning that you need to do. And it takes a lot of power. So obviously we're going to need to to reroute power some places, you know, maybe shut off some Bitcoin mines for a little bit. So that way people aren't sweating when they're trying to just do their job. You know, you mentioned, and this is something that was in the video, the educational video on curtailment, which people should check out if they're interested, or if they don't want to have to explain it to someone else, you could just send them that video. But you mentioned something that was so paramount to curtailment, at least from a customer side or, you know, from the customer or client or someone who's hosting, especially with Compass or anyone who's thinking about the profitability of the Bitcoin mining and how that relationship kind of plays with curtailment you're going to get more competitive energy prices when you sign up essentially to play ball and, and play well in the sandbox, which is essentially curtailment. The summer is coming up. You are a guy who's developing Bitcoin mining sites for Compass. You are helping to train up people to be able to, you know, make the sites more efficient. You're thinking about training. What do you think this summer is going to bring? Cause I feel like every summer there's a new challenge in Bitcoin mining, the heat, the price, whatever that may be. What are some of the things you're thinking about as you, we kind of get into this summer? Definitely the heat. Um, you know, we're continuing to see record numbers all across North America and they just keep increasing. So that's something that we're definitely thinking a lot about trying to make airflow improvements to sites, you know, um, exhaust improvements as well, trying to mitigate as much heat reintroduction as we can. That's a that's one of the biggest ones I would say because you can't always change environmental factors, right? It's always going to get hot, but we're going to have to find ways to cool our machines still. And I think you know coming up, we're going to see a lot more people transition to immersion and hydro just because of that. I mean, a lot of the places where Bitcoin mining is most prevalent is in the southern U.S., and unfortunately, that's where it gets the hottest. So we're going to have to find some ways to engineer around the environmental factors there. You know, it's interesting. We started this conversation. We were talking about how in 2016, you were GPU mining, right? And then you're like, yeah. And then I got an A6 and it was like, okay, this is different, right? Yeah. I wonder if in five years we'll be talking, whether it's on mic or we're just sitting at a bar and we're like, you know what? It's crazy now. It used to be 3% of the entire industry was immersion mining. But as you're saying, due to the heat, especially in the south of the United States, if we're thinking about the U.S. context of Bitcoin mining, I wonder if the future is immersion, but like on a mass scale, if people want to stay in hotter climates. Does that, does, I mean, does that seem like a very logical trajectory at this point? I think it does, yeah, because there's always going to be power there, but, you know, when the, the machines continuously get more efficient, they also get more hotter. Like they, they put out a lot of heat. Some of these machines now, you know, we have mines that run close to 140 degrees on the hot side. Um, and they're just going to continue to run faster and faster. And the faster they run, the hotter they get. So eventually we're going to get to a point where I think at least air cooling is just not an option, especially in certain environments. Yeah, that's a conversation I, I've had recently with a couple of people that we're just going to hit a point where it's just not going to be tenable, yeah. the, especially in the south of the United States. So that's going to be interesting to see because 
Maybe it is all immersion. I don't know. There's maybe there's something else. I'm. Yeah, I'm... It's, it's it's really hard to tell. Um, you know, you can never really. Yeah, you think it's going to go one way and it goes the other way. Uh, these ASIC manufacturers, they're always throwing us for a loop. So <laughs> we're just kind of along for the ride. As we look ahead, 2024, yeah. somehow we're almost in the third quarter. What are your thoughts on overall Bitcoin mining as we move into 2020, the end of 2024 and we get into 2025? What are some trends you think uh, we're, we're going to see in the industry? I definitely think we're going to see the number go up. That's what I'm hoping for. I know after the halving, it was a little weird for a while with a machine profitability. And it's, I think it's still going to be a little weird for a while, but I'm hopeful that the, there's going to be a correction for the price of Bitcoin. And I think it'll, it'll help us even everything out. Ultimately, I think I'm not going to you know say, I think Bitcoin's going to be a hundred thousand dollars, but I'm super hopeful that it might soon. I mean, we're trending around 70 K, which you know, it's an all time high. And I think that's something that we got to be hopeful for and keep looking forward to is just more all time highs. And I think the more machines we get online, the more secure we make the network. I think that's, that's going to play a big part in that. Yeah. I, I think, you know, as Bitcoin miners, it's like, we're always looking at the overall global exahash as an indicator of health, just as obviously we're looking at the Bitcoin price as an indicator of profitability. So I'm also thinking that as the number go up, more and more miners will come online. And I'm interested to see how much the exahash grows over the next six months as we get into 2025. Um, Dylan, this has been great. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. I know you wear a lot of hats at Compass operations training and safety manager um do you want to take a moment and shout out where people can get in touch with you yeah i'm on linkedin feel free to connect with me i'm always happy to talk about bitcoin mining uh it's one of my great passions so i'm always willing to share any information anyone needs um yeah just i'm always willing to discuss bitcoin <laughs> sounds good i will add your linkedin into the episode description if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please go ahead and subscribe. No matter where you're listening to us, please find us on social media uh, on X, which is Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Compass Mining. So yeah, thanks again for taking the time to, to hop on and chat about safety, training, operations, setting up a site. This has been great. And I uh, look forward to hopefully meeting you IRL someday. Sounds great, Jerry. It was great talking to you as well. Thank you for having me.